And uh, sometimes I look over my notes from the morning message and I realize I forgot something that I planned to say. And usually, oh, well, it didn't make it in. It didn't make it in. But I did want to add that sometimes I'm like, you know what? I'll, I'll just throw in a little bit of addendum before I start the Sunday night message because maybe this, this was worthy of being mentioned. I just didn't see it in my notes. But, but we talked about Malchus losing his ear. And, and there's a message in that as well for sometimes we don't appreciate what we have until it's taken away, including the ears that are attached to your head. And there's so many blessings that we have that we just take for granted until it's suddenly gone. And I was thinking about Malchus losing the ear and seconds later having it reattached. If, if you were him, if I was him, I would not be able to stop fiddling with that thing the rest of the day or the, the next week. Like I'd wake up from an app and be like, is it still there? And like, I could see my wife would be like, what are you doing? <laughs> oh, like, I didn't even realize I'm just, just making sure we're good. So it just, it's just, what is it in your life that we just, we just assume it's always there, but it could be gone. And after that, uh, if you get it back, you'll realize how good you had it, how, how much of a blessing it was to have it. And so let's be a thankful and appreciative people uh, every day. But Mark 15, and we're here this week, and it's uh, whether you call it Holy Week or Gospel Week or uh, the days leading up to the resurrection of Christ and, uh, and all of the things that go along with it. And, and the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ is a somber topic, and it's always a sobering uh, it's the most sobering event in all of human history, in the history of the universe. There is not a heavier and more serious uh, and more somber subject than the crucifixion of Christ. It's God in the flesh, the only absolutely sinless man who has ever lived, yet treated like the most vile, the most rotten sinner and offender who has ever, li who has ever lived. And his suffering was immense, not just the physical suffering, the emotional suffering that the Lord endured, he was forsaken by the Father. The, how new of an experience would that have been for him? He had always fellowshiped perfectly with the Father from all of eternity past. But there was a moment when he became sin for us and is forsaken by the Father. And, and Habakkuk tells us in chapter 1 that the Father canst not look upon iniquity. Our iniquity was on him. And he, he endured broken fellowship with his father for the first time. And that kind of suffering is just immense. And so I would encourage uh, wherever you are in your personal Bible reading plan, this would be a good week to just suspend it for the week and either add to or replace. Uh, but, but read Matthew 26, 27, and 28 this week. Read Mark 14, 15, and 16 this week. Luke 22, 23, 24. John 18, 19, 20, and 21. Just throw that on your Bible reading and just be in tune uh, with, with what's recorded there because a, as we mature in the faith, we should be increasingly moved by what our Lord endured for us. And we should be increasingly affected by it rather than increasingly immune to it and unaffected. That's the natural bent that we have is, is in the flesh, we get less appreciative and less moved. We just get used to things whether it's having an ear or having a savior. We just get used to things. So we have to be intentional about uh, being affected by what our Lord did for us and being moved by what our Lord did for us, especially when we remember that it was all motivated by love. That's why he did it. As bad as it was, he did it for you out of his love for you. Uh, Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Uh, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And as we read these last few chapters of the gospel, it's about Jesus giving himself for you. Why did he give himself for you? Because he loved you so much. He's just, he is love. And so that, that, that ought to move us. But let's look at Mark 15. We'll read 33 to 38. Let's stand to give reverence as we read Mark 15, verse 33 through verse 38. When the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them that stood by when they heard it said, behold, he calleth Elias. And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink saying, let alone, uh, let us see whether Elias will come, down, will come to take him down. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple 
was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. Again, Lord, we need you. We depend on your spirit to guide us into all understanding. Uh, this time has been set aside that we might profit from thy precious word. And we are precious in your sight, only in your grace. Thank you, Lord, for all the things in our life mattering to you. And thank you for what you've explained to us and recorded. May we grow in our knowledge of you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. God did a number of miracles when Christ was on the cross to, to bring attention to the unprecedented significance of what was happening and how important it was. That's what miracles do. They draw attention. And in a few short verses here, we read of, of several miracles, the darkness across the land. That was at a time of day that it was not naturally dark. But as Jesus is dying for sin, as the sin of the world is placed on him, there's a supernatural darkness. Before Jesus dies, before he gives up the ghost, he cries with a loud voice. That is his deity on display because a crucifixion victim naturally and biologically has no loud voice to cry with. Uh, biologically, the crucifixion victim cannot muster any breath. When they've been uh, nailed to a cross in this position this long, there's no breath left to cry with. But as Jesus is about to die, he lifts up his voice. And with a loud voice, he says, it is finished. And each of the seven sayings on the cross have their own purpose. But that, that was supernatural as well. And the, the, another one that we read about here is, our, is under our consideration tonight. And so our title tonight is The Torn Veil in the Temple. And that's the other significant uh, action event that occurred while when Christ died is that the veil, verse 38, the veil in the temple was rent from top to bottom. So let's consider the torn veil in the temple. What was this veil? A little bit of a history of this veil. Back in uh, Exodus at the law of Sinai, when the law was given, the law of God was given to Moses. Uh, Acts to, uh, Exodus 26 says there was to be this curtain that would separate the holy place from the most holy place. And the curtain was made of purple and blue and scarlet, a fine twine linen, and it had pictures of cherubim or angels on it. And it was a divider. It was a barrier that separated the most holy place from the holy place. And many preachers and commentators will refer to it as it separated the holy of holies from the holy place. The Bible doesn't actually use the phrase the holiest of holies. It uses the phrase the most holy place. Perhaps a matter of semantics, but it functioned as a barrier. And what was behind the curtain? The Ark of the Covenant was behind the curtain. And uh, the Ark of the Covenant, of course, represents the presence of Almighty God and the glory of God that dwelt above the Ark and, uh, and all that went along with that. And so how often was that veil gone through? How often was that veil surpassed? Only once a year. On the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, when uh, the high priest would they'd take uh, a scapegoat, the sin would be placed on the head of the scapegoat to picture uh, the sin being taken away. But then the other one was the sin offering. The other animal was the sin offering, and it would be slain, and its blood, the, the, only the high priest would go through the veil and place the blood on the mercy seat, sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. It says the priest would go beyond the veil. And so that's the veil that's discussed here. And so that was the tabernacle in the wilderness at ex during the time of the Exodus. But then that tabernacle is, is functioning for, for centuries until the time of Solomon. And Solomon is charged with the task of building a more permanent dwelling place. Uh, and so First Chronicles and Second Chronicles explain to us that, that as the systems and activities of the tabernacle, they were then transferred to a permanent dwelling, the temple, Solomon's temple. And Solomon's temple was very similar to the tabernacle. The layout was, was mostly the same. Uh, the only difference being that Solomon's temple was just more ornate and fancier and more time had gone into preparing the things in there. Uh, but, but that temple, a little while later, gets destroyed. And the Babylonians take it, including the Ark of the Covenant. And 70 years later, the people are released from captivity and Ezra is on a mission from God to rebuild the temple and he does. Uh, and so the temple is rebuilt and uh, some, a couple hundred years go by and then we, we come up to the time of Herod. And Herod, at the time of Christ, renovated the temple on a massive scale. Herod made everything bigger. Herod made everything fancier because the one that Ezra built was really just a, 
not much compared to Solomon's. In fact, the older people that remembered Solomon's temple wept because the best version they could, and Haggai took them the task over that, that this, this building is nothing like it used to be because you haven't cared about God enough to make it what it used to be. Uh, and so Herod has more secular reasons for renovating it, but Herod's renovations were uh, indeed very impressive. And then fast forward to the time of Jesus' death, the veil's still there and it's torn. So that tells us that it was a consistent staple and feature of the tabernacle slash temple all those years. There was a veil there the whole time separating the holy place from the most holy place through all of those iterations. And we don't know from scripture the dimensions of how big this curtain was. We're not told how large it was, but there are some historians that are very reputable and reliable, one of them being Josephus who lived uh, right around the time of Christ, not long after. And so much of what Josephus has recorded has, has checked out and been confirmed by all kinds of archaeological discoveries. And Josephus tells us that the veil that was rent at the time that Jesus died was the one that had been in place since Ezra. So 600 years. And it was 60 feet high, 30 feet wide, and four inches thick. It's a massive curtain. Now, that's not infallible. Maybe that's right. Maybe that's wrong. But that's what reliable history seems to show. And so how big is 60 feet? For a frame of reference, on the Mount, uh, Mount Rushmore, George Washington's face is 60 feet high. I have not seen Mount Rushmore personally, but it's a, it's a mountain. It's Mount Rushmore. And so this is a, a very large curtain and veil. And so how did it get that thick? Well, over 600 years. Once a year, blood gets sprinkled and it can get a little messy. And so as, as the veil is covered in blood, they would uh, weave new outer coverings. They would weave it into the veil while it is hanging in place. And so it got thicker and thicker as new outer coverings are being woven into it over the course of 600 years. And so that is quite a piece of furniture to tear from top to bottom. and the timing of its tearing cannot be overlooked. It is undeniably an act of God as it correlates to the death of Christ when you take into account that it's in the temple and the whole temple system, the whole Levitical system, the whole Aaronic system, the whole animal sacrifice system, the whole layout in the most holy place and the offerings under the ark and all of that, it all only existed to point to the one who would fulfill it to point to the one who would replace it. And it, that veil was central to all of that. And so what a, what a message from God that is, that at the very moment of the death of the testator, the one who would replace all that, it falls apart. It just is torn from top to bottom at the death of the testator who replaced it. Very obviously, a message from God is being sent. And so what does that message entail and what are we to take from this? Number one, it's rending removed a barrier. It's rending removed a barrier. The veil blocked entrance. It was guarded carefully. Uh, you could only go in. Remember, that ark is behind the veil and the average person is just not allowed to see the ark. Over a period of 1,500 years coming up to this point, I mean, when is the tabernacle instituted? 1,500 years before Christ. And that Mosaic law is active for those 1500 years. And uh, that's where the ark is placed. And that is authorized personnel only, God himself being in charge of the security. And so there was fear and nervousness and trepidation. You don't go in at the wrong time. Even the priest, even the one man could go in, the high priest, he could only go in on the day of atonement. If a high priest said, I think I'll just go in there and put my feet up on it like it's a, a coffee table, what would God do? Stri smite him strike him down dead. Uh, and so we know how closely God guarded those things. The Philistines end up with the ark. Did not go well for them. In fact, they were like, we got to get rid of this thing. Too many plagues are happening. God zealously guarded the sacred nature of the ark and the veil goes right along with that ark. Remember Uzzah? Uzzah had a little bit of a misstep in his caring for the ark. As the ark was being transported, it was not being carried biblically and properly. And when Uzzah reached forth to grab it, it was supposed to be carried on staves. They had it on an ark, on a cart. They were already testing God. 
And then when he goes to put his own hand to something so sacred, he's smitten down dead on the spot. And so God is saying, I, I govern and I watch the goings on of this area uh, very seriously. I take it very seriously. In fact, when the Babylonians stole it, when Nebuchadnezzar came against the Solomon's temple and took everything, we're not told in scripture what exactly became of the ark. Uh, we don't, it's one of history's greatest mysteries, where, where the ark went and who had it. Ethiopians claim they have it and replicas and theories and movies are made about it. But I, I'm just guessing based on how closely God says he guards it, that the Babylonians, the, the, the soldiers, as low as they might've been in ranking, I bet God smote some of them dead when they first went in to haul some of the vessels out of the temple. I bet there's dead Babylonians that populate the trail that follows the Ark of the Covenant. But when Jesus offered that perfect payment for sin, the entire temple worship system only existed to point to him. And the veil was a representation of that whole temple system. It's one of the largest pieces in the whole building. And the moment Jesus fulfilled everything that building was designed to point to, the barrier came down and universal access is granted. And there is no more any trepidation or any nervousness or any fear in going before the presence of the Lord. No more. Now, what, what, were, what are we told in Hebrews for? You can now come boldly under the throne of grace to obtain mercy and to find grace to help in time of need. What a blessing that every time you pray, you don't have to enter before the presence of the Lord nervously. You don't have to enter before the presence of the Lord timidly fearing that you might misstep and be smitten down severely. You can enter boldly and confidently because of what Christ has done for us. But when that barrier was in place, and this is important, that did not mean that for those 1,500 years that the presence of God could not be accessed by anyone other than the high priest once a year. Uh, it doesn't, it, it, that's, that's a foolish uh, conclusion to draw from it in the sense that sometimes well-meaning preachers in their honest attempt to declare the significance of what Christ has done for us, sometimes they will unwittingly diminish the nature of God in the Old Testament. And you'll hear this often, this, this unbiblical simplification that's like, in the Old Testament, God was distant and angry and killed everybody and what was just cranky and aloof. And But then in the New Testament, Jesus comes around and suddenly God is loving and happy and gracious and so near to everybody. That's a mischaracterization. Just because he guarded carefully a special place that he had consecrated for himself doesn't mean that God himself was unavailable to people. It doesn't mean that God's presence was confined to a 15-foot room for, for 1,500 years. That, that is a tragic diminishing of the nature and character of God. In fact, during those same 1,500 years that the Mosaic Law was in force, we get other scriptures that talk about the presence of God. Uh, we get the Psalms and we're told in Psalm 23 that even when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, God says, he'll be with you. You can still have his presence. You didn't have to be in the most holy place to access God. He would still hear you. He is a very present help in trouble. Even in the Old Testament, even under the Mosaic law, when you were in trouble, Psalm 46 said that God was very present with you. In Psalm 139, we find that you can't flee from the presence of God. It doesn't matter how far you go. Uh, God is omnipotent. That's part of his nature, and that never changes. He's always been accessible and available. Jonah rose up to flee from the presence of the Lord. Well, Jonah wasn't a priest. Jonah was from the tribe of Zebulun. He wasn't a Levite, but he still was in the presence of the Lord before he rose up to flee. And so Isaiah tells us, even if you are, uh, when thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. When the, when the waters uh, rise, I will be with thee. And so all these promises, even during those Mosaic law years, are still that God is willing to be with you. And so then what's the difference? The difference is just that the official, ceremonial, ritualistic, corporate uh, uh, 
rituals, uh, they, they, there's the fa- there still were rules they had to abide by. There were still some, re- I mean, anyone could pray and be heard, but when, when it comes down to the officially established worship system, there were some rules that had to be followed. And if they weren't followed, well, God said, I expect you to follow them and there's going to be consequences for failing to. And that meant that there was a special privilege that the high priest had that nobody else had. Yeah, you could pray and be heard. You could know that God was with you, but you could only be in that special, unique, rare place if you were just one man. And, and there would be something you'd get to see that nobody else got to see. And there is a glory, a bright, noticeable, visible glory cloud that abode over the mercy seat of the ark that you would get to see that nobody else got to see. And that was special and rare. And when Christ became the great high priest, that veil was torn down. That barrier came down. And that means no more rituals, no more ceremonies. The veil is down. That means no restrictions whatsoever. There were, there, were some, there were some restrictions, now there's none, that anyone can experience the presence of God, even though you're not a high priest in any capacity, at any time, from anywhere. And so that is amazing to consider it that way. And so the message isn't so much about whether access to God was limited then. The message is more about how, how unlimited our access to God is now always in every place, from every spot, all around the world. There, we all get to enjoy what a special and rare and unique privilege always because we have access, Romans 5, 2, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Ephesians three twelve, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Uh, we talk often about the hope that we have. That's the anchor of our soul. Our souls are to be anchored in the storms of life that howl and swirl and blow and threaten to blow everything over. We've got an anchor and our hope of Christ is the anchor. And Hebrews 6 says that anchor is sure and it's steadfast. And we usually kind of stop quoting the verse there, but it goes on to say in the very same verse, and entereth into the veil. It's speaking of uh, Christ entering into within that veil. And so being reminded that there there used to be some restrictions helps us not to take for granted that there are no restrictions now to accessing the Lord, that we all get this special privilege that was reserved only for the high priest and we get it 24-7. And and that speaks to the goodness of God, that any time you come to him, he never says, yeah, but you're not the right person. He never says, yeah, but this is not the right time. And you get the maximum amount. You don't get less than the high priest, God. He says, I, I'm always open. I'm never closed for business. And you never have to be shut out because of the time of day or because of the location or because of who you are. And that's so easy to take for granted that he's just available 24-7 to us all the time. And then number two, uh, it's rending abolished rituals. So it brought down a barrier. It also abolished rituals. Suppose that a vandal had come along. This is Suppose that before Christ arrives in the scene, some vandal comes along and starts tearing down the veil. Well, that's an act of blasphemous desecration. And of course, the Lord is not fond of that and perhaps would smite that person on the spot. But yet here, God himself tears his own veil. Anybody else had done it, it would have been vandalism. But here, God does it. He tears his own veil to declare that the entire temple worship system of all the Levitical priests and all of the goings on with all of its intricacies and all of its rules and all of its regulations and all of its ceremonies and all of that is is at this moment rendered null and void and rendered obsolete and instantly deactivated because of what was taking place just outside the walls of Jericho at a place called Golgotha when the testator died, when the man who all of those things for 1,500 years pictured, it is finished and he fulfilled it all. And the moment he dies at the time of his death, it comes crashing down. It's torn and rent and all that it, it represents, which is very significant. The tabernacle, the temple, 1,500 years of How many generations of priests? How many tens of thousands of priests? 
How many animal offerings over 1,500 years? Millions, probably. Not quantifiable. And Jesus says, it is finished. He's like, all of that is finished. All of that's over with. All of those bulls and goats and all of those lamps and candlesticks and all of that, it's finished. And if you want to read Hebrews 9 and 10, it kind of breaks down specifically how Jesus fulfilled every aspect of that system. And what, hap what was happening is God was removing himself from the temple. God was saying, it's not about that building anymore. He's removing himself from the temple. The, the breaking of the veil, the rending of the temple represents, the, the veil represents the whole temple system. And God is breaking his temple. Why? Because who is the true temple? Jesus Christ says that he's going to raise up this temple. He is the true temple. And it corresponds that, that when Jesus' body, take of this bread, this represents my body broken for you. As the true temple is broken, the veil that represents the physical temple is broken. Uh, it's broken because Jesus' body is broken and he is, he spake of the temple of his body. But remember that Jesus came unto his own and his own received him not. That he is despised and rejected. And the Jews, by and large, had a, a veil of unbelief blinding them that they rejected the Lord and uh, insisted that instead they had Abraham to their father and they had Moses to their father. And what were they doing? They were stubbornly and foolishly clinging to the types and pictures and shadows rather than the substance that all of those pictures and shadows for 1,500 years were designed to point to. They were all about Jesus. And they, they re could you, how silly is it to prefer a picture of your loved one instead of your loved one? A picture with no beating heart, a picture with no skin to touch, not a real person. No, I'd rather be married to this picture instead. I'd rather spend time with this picture instead. And that's what unbelieving Israel was doing. They preferred the pictures and the shadows rather than the person. And so then God destroys his own veil and destroys his own temple. And God removes himself from that temple. You'd think they'd get the message that this 60-foot curtain is in tatters at the moment Jesus dies. But yet they continue on with animal sacrifices. They continue on with the priesthood. They continue on with temple worship. And that's why the book of, that's what made the book of Hebrews necessary is that so many people didn't get it. And they kept doing the stuff they were doing before. And it's astounding to think that when the veil came down, there were people that looked at it and said, we should put that thing back up. We should fix that. What's that thing doing down there? We need to fix it and get it back up there and go back to what we're, how blind could you be uh, to the significance and what God was doing if you're paying any attention to what was happening just outside the city walls. In Acts chapter four and five, you've got preachers, John and Peter going into the temple, but they're not there to mess around with the veil. They're not there to offer sacrifices. They're there to explain the true temple is Jesus's body and he's risen. They're preachers of the resurrection and their message to the people in the temple was that it's not about this building anymore. This building was only about Jesus and his temple of his body is risen from the grave and without him, you're going to hell. That was their message. And that was Stephen's message that got him killed. Stephen was stoned to death and they became angry and gnashed on Stephen with their teeth because... He said that God doesn't dwell in buildings made with hands anymore. This is obsolete now. This is irrelevant now. This is nullified and void now. And it's only about Christ. And that's the message that got Stephen martyred. That's the message that took his life. And then in Acts 21, Paul almost makes the mistake of offering animal sacrifices. The fact that they would continue on is astounding. But Paul goes on missionary journeys and comes back to Jerusalem. And James has a very... He reports to James, the pastor of the church at Jerusalem, and James has very foolish advice for him. He says, there's people uh, in the city who think you're wrong about doctrine, and he encourages them, James encourages Paul to go into the temple and offer animal sacrifices. And uh, that's a foolish decision on his part. Hello, come on in. Uh, a foolish decision on the part of James to send Paul into the temple to offer animal sacrifices because the sacrifice has already been given. There, there's no reason for animal sacrifices anymore, but James is concerned about Paul's relationship with the Jews. And he says, you should go into the temple and offer sacrifice. And so Paul is foolishly planning on doing it. 
until God providentially intercedes and prevents Paul from offering any animal sacrifices. In fact, how does that happen in Acts 21? Paul gets jumped. God actually uses a, a, a band of violent men to stop Paul from offering animal sacrifices to show that this is not uh, any longer the sacrifice that's needed. But what I really love is the millennial temple in Ezekiel. Ezekiel describes what the temple will be like during the thousand years that Christ reigns on this earth. And the Bible says Ezekiel describes all that is therein, and he doesn't describe a veil at all. There is no veil in the millennial temple. There's no ark in the millennial temple because the ark represents the presence of God and the veil represents access being blocked and access being denied. But Jesus himself will be there and he he will be accessible to everybody live and physically and in the flesh. And that means that everybody can come boldly, be, but there is a throne in the millennial temple. There's no veil, there's no ark, but there is a throne. It's Jesus' throne. And that means you can physically and in real, in this realm, you can come boldly before the literal throne of his grace and obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need, live and in the flesh. And so that was number two, it abolished rituals. And lastly, number three, it's rending required a miracle. It's rending required a miracle. Whether or not the dimensions were exactly what Josephus said they are, obviously it was a huge and thick piece of fabric and it would have been completely impossible for any normal man to tear it from top to bottom with no uh, supernatural aid uh, no one could have done that. They say that a, a team of horses tied to each side of it, pulling as hard as they could, could not have rent that veil. And both Matthew and Mark include the specific detail that it was rent from top to bottom. So even if it wasn't 60 feet high, even if it was 40 feet high, how are you going to get heavy equipment up that high? to rent? So suppose fallen fallible men played a prank to break it themselves what kind of instrument or equipment would you need to apply that much force to the top? You need some kind of scaffolding. You need some kind of heavy equipment. And, and how would nobody notice that? Because that's in the temple, and we're told there was activity in the temple 24-7. You remember Anna at the time that Jesus was born? She, was off, she departed not from the temple. She offered up prayers night and day. And so how come if, if someone brought in scaffolding and large heavy equipment to, to tear this thing apart, how come nobody saw it? Wouldn't that have been noticed? How large of an undertaking would that have been? So no doubt about it. It was a work of God with no fallen human participation. But here's, here's a good question. It, it was a work of God. Was it the father or the son who rent the veil and the tearing? Let's look, look at Hebrews 9. Go over to Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9, verse 11. Hebrews 9, 11, But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Verse 23, it was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. And so the Everything in the Old Testament Levitical system had to be fulfilled by Christ. It all pointed to Christ, including the Day of Atonement. That was about Christ too. And so Christ had to fulfill everything that happened at the Day of Atonement. And so when Jesus died, uh, he would come back into his body in 72 hours, but there were things that he had to do in order to fulfill the Day of Atonement. His blood had to be placed on the mercy seat. The sin of mankind had to be taken away. What did the scapegoat do? It represented the taking away of our sin. Jesus brought our sin to hell. Jesus took our sin away where it would be punished. Uh, we know that his body when he died would remain on the cross until Joseph of Arimathea came to take it down. We know that he commended his spirit to God, but in his soul, 
he had some work to do. There were some things, the keys needed to be secured of death and hell. And he had to speak to the thief on the cross that he said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. He had places to go and things to do. And he had to fulfill the day of atonement. His blood had to be placed on the mercy seat, which is the on the ark. And so did the father levitate the blood of Jesus to where, so where was the ark? Well, we don't know. The Herod's temple, most scholars and historians believe that the most holy place beyond the veil was just empty because the whereabouts of the ark were unknown. Some believe there was a replica. What we know for sure is that by Revelation 11, God says the ark is in heaven. So God has complete control. God knows exactly where the ark is. It belongs to him. And God did not let it get into the wrong hands. And God is the one who designed the system that the right blood needs to be on it. So we know the soul of Jesus definitely placed, collected his blood somehow, whether it was from his cross or from his body, but in his soul, he went to heaven where the ark is by Revelation 11 and he placed his blood on it. And uh, even though it wasn't in the temple, the veil was still in the temple. And so it seems that the soul of Jesus went into the temple and tore the temple himself to communicate and declare that someone had gone beyond the veil. Because when was the temp when was the veil breached? When the high priest went through it to place the blood on the mercy seat. And so Jesus went to to went through the veil and tore it to indicate to all in the temple that someone has been through here and the blood has been placed on the mercy seat, and it was the high priest of the day of atonement that, that went through. And Jesus became the high priest, the only one authorized to present that blood on the mercy seat. So he would have tore the veil himself. And, and there had to have been priests on duty that day. Think about that. Think about being, because the, there were the, the priests who daily offer sacrifice, there was always a priest on duty. Now, the soul of Jesus probably would not have been visible like a ghost. But, but think of visualize being a priest on duty in the temple. And there's a lot of activity going on just outside Jerusalem because there's a man that's just been put to death who claimed that he was God, who claimed that he was the temple, and he's being put to death. And, you, and there, the knowledge of it is public because we know that Mary was there at the crucifixion. We know that John was there at the crucifixion. How much the priests that were standing in the temple knew, we can't be certain. But all this scuttle is going around about who this guy was. And as he's put to death, you're watching a 60-foot, four-inch thick veil being torn. And perhaps not seeing a person, but seeing it being torn. And then perhaps you'd also have heard the, the rumors that he had said on numerous occasions that three days and three nights he'd be dead, but then he was coming back. And can you picture being a temple, a priest in the temple and all those things have happened and you've watched this thing come down? that's been in place for 600 years and it's just torn mysteriously and miraculously. And these preachers come in and tell you the one who, who was just put to death is the one who has fulfilled all of this and none of this matters anymore. And this veil represents this whole building and it's all rendered null and void now by that one man who's risen from the grave. And that's why this veil is on the floor. That's why it's not here anymore. People are like, well, how come I can see into there? I'm not supposed to be able to see into there, but it's on the floor. And then you hear three days later that the body somehow went missing. That they didn't recover the body and the Jews can't find the body and the Romans can't find the body. Put all that stuff together. The, for the first time in 600 years, the veil's just broken and it represents the body of the man who said he is the temple and now the tomb is empty and, and the, the, the veil comes down and now they can't find his body. No wonder a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith, as we said this morning, and got saved. What a testimony that would be as you add all of these facts up. What a marvelous testimony that would be. And how could you not believe as every piece of that comes together? Man, wouldn't you love to be transported to that time and place, to hear the sound of the ripping and tearing, to see the veil uh, that had been in place all those years, on the floor in a pile on the floor and to hear these preachers explain why and explain who did it and why it happened and what's been fulfilled. Man, you, you can go there to that time and place through the pages of this book.
as you read them, as you contemplate them, as you reflect and meditate, what a marvelous story. I've got a story to tell to the nations. I love to tell the story, and God tells it better than anybody. And so let's love his story. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the Lord Jesus Christ. How we praise you for, Lord, giving us access to you always. And Lord Jesus, how we praise you for tearing down that veil. Lord, for being everything for us. We thank you for your great love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Appreciate you being here tonight. We'll catch you Wednesday night, everybody. We're adjourned.